You know, I love the Millers, and it's so much fun watching people like Todd have to raise three girls and knowing that guys are going to come to the house, you know, and there's so many ways, dads, I can help you uh, with guys that come to the house with regard to your daughters, and you need to handle them roughly, okay? Because when they come and say, hey, is this Beth Ann's home? You go, no, it's my house, bro. And there's just different things you can do. You know, I don't mind going back to prison. There's all kinds of things. You know, I can help you with that. And, and so uh, today we're going to talk some about that. It's so good to have more of our people baptized, over 100 people already baptized. You're bringing your friends. Uh, they're coming to know, love, and follow Jesus. And one way you do that is you're baptized. And we have a culture of discipleship we've built in to venture to help them grow and to uh, understand what evangelism is and discipleship and serving and giving. And so, man, we're so thankful for you and proud of you uh, for what you're doing. Now, we're in a series called Picture Perfect, and it's about the family. And the idea is there's no family that's picture perfect. We all have issues. How many of you on the way here thought about murdering someone in your car? Just raise your hand. Yeah, don't point at them. I see you, yeah, I see you young man as a kid. He's like, yeah, I thought about murdering my parents. And so we, we understand how difficult that is. And so today we're going to talk about, we're going to start with singles because they always say, hey, you always get left out. You know, y'all don't care about singles. You know, you don't care about singles. And we do love singles. And let me say there are a lot of single people out there that they are single because they feel called to be single. Now, I didn't have that calling. Uh, and so I don't know all about that, but many of you have the calling to be single and you use time to serve the Lord that you wouldn't have if you were married because marriage takes a lot of time. Marriage takes a lot of energy. And Paul said, it's better if you can, uh, not marry, don't marry, just serve God, uh, and give God all of your time and all of your energy. But if you don't have that gift, go ahead and marry and serve the Lord. So, you know, Jesus was single, Paul was single. We go through all that. What I'm saying is if you're single and you feel called to be single, I'm going to tell everybody that knows you, hey, leave them alone. Quit trying to hook them up with people at work. Quit trying to say, when are you getting married? When are you going to have kids? You know, I know somebody, blah, blah, blah. Leave them alone and just encourage them and love them uh, because they feel called to be single. Uh, but for many people out there, uh, Hattiesburg has about 60% of our population is single. And a lot of people, they would like to get married. They just can't find the right person. Matter of fact, the reason they can't find the right person is there's not a lot of people out there. I mean, there's more women than there are men. Uh, there are a lot of people have been burnt in relationships. Uh, there are a lot of people that are postponing marriage to a lot later in life. Uh, there are a lot of guys who are still at home playing video games. I'm not criticizing you. I love video games. I'm at home playing video, video games. It's just my house. And so the reality is it makes it more and more difficult for you to find somebody to marry. And many of you are saying, hey, the ladies here are saying, hey, I don't need a mate. I need a miracle. <laughs> like I've looked around and I've kind of shopped around and I realize, hey, there's nobody out there that I'm really interested in and I'm dating people, but it's really not enjoyable. And I'm just trying to, you know, have something to do on the weekends and, and you need a miracle. <clears throat> a lot like the movie, Marry Me. Did you, anybody see that movie, Marry Me? Did you see that? You hadn't seen it? It's, well, you don't have to see it. Uh, but it's a great movie if you like that kind of stuff. It's like a Hallmark movie with hotter people. Uh, Jennifer Lopez, you know, is in it, and she's a movie. She's like a rock star, and so she's dating a guy, and they're engaged, but he's messing around on her. And Owen Wilson is a widowed father who teaches math, and his daughter goes to a concert with him, and he goes with her because she wanted him to go, and she has a sign that says, Marry Me. And right at the beginning of the concert, you know, Jennifer Lopez is so angry and upset. She goes, yes, I will marry you. And brings him up on stage. And you're like, wow, wow, maybe that will happen to me. It's not going to happen to you. And it's okay. But you do get to make a decision. And the Old Testament, they didn't get to make a decision. Now, all the dads are going to love this because in the Old Testament, the parents got to decide who the son and daughter would marry. And so they would, you know, connect them together. There were arranged marriages. We know people, Leisha and I do, from other countries. This has actually happened to them. 
and they're happily married. They have kids. They can't understand why you'd go through the drama of dating people, and they are so happy. But you get to choose, and so we're going to talk about some principles from the Bible that you can use forever. And if you're a parent, this has something to do with you. If you're a man, this has something to do with you. If you're a single lady, this has something to do with you. And if you're married, this message is going to hit you. We're going to hit everybody. It's an overview of a family series that we don't want you to miss any of the weeks. I know a lot of people went to Garth Brooks last night, and they're not here because uh, they couldn't get out of bed for a lot of different reasons. Uh, Genesis chapter 24, not all of them, uh, you know, not all of them were, were drunk. But I'm just saying, Jennifer, uh, Genesis 24, beginning of verse 1. Let me give the background real quick. Abraham, remember Abraham and Sarah, they were old. They had a baby. His name is Isaac. Remember that? Uh, laughter, because they laughed. And so Isaac is getting older, and they had a covenant promise, okay, that God gave both Abraham and Sarah that your children and descendants would be like the, the stars in the sky, like the sands on the seashore. And the problem is, Isaac is single and he's 40 years old. So if, you know, if you're 40 or 50 and you're single or single again, I mean, this message, it, it connects with you. And his dad is concerned, as dads can get, because the covenant promises descendants. And how can you have descendants if you don't have a wife and they don't have children? So he's putting all this together. And he sends his servant, Eliezer, to go and find a bride for his son. And, and the way he does this is so interesting because he's got to go and kind of go, go to the right place and, and pray. And then he finds someone and will they go back? And they don't have to go back, but if they go back, then he's kind of succeeded and they can have a family and the promise can continue. Now, I know you're not following all of that, but that's the best I can do because Genesis 24 is a long chapter and I can't read the whole thing. So Genesis 24 verse 1 Abraham was now very old, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. And he said to his senior servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. And it was the idea that, that your descendants would come from your body. And I want you to pray to the Lord, the God of heaven, the covenant God, uh, that you will not get a wife from the daughters of the Canaanites. They were not the covenant people among whom I am living, but you will go to my country and my relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. And the servant asked him, what if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I take your son back there to the country you came from? He says, make sure you don't do that. And if she says no, you're off the hook. This is not a name it and claim it. If she doesn't say yes, it's okay. Verse 15, okay, the, the servant gets to the well where all the women come to draw water. And, and before he had finished praying, he's praying. Now, this is his prayer. God, I'm praying that I'm going to ask one of these ladies. Now, now, think about this. I'm going to ask one of these ladies to give me a drink of water. And, and I'll know that's the right one when, when she says, hey, let me also water your 10 camels. So that'll be my sign that this is the right person. And so... Before he had finished praying, wouldn't you love that to be praying and God answer your prayer right as you're finishing? Amen, there she is. Amen, there he is. Well, it, it can happen, okay? So we're going to talk about that in a second. Before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with a jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Melchi, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor, which means snorer, snorer in Hebrew, really does. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. She went down to the spring, filled the water jar, came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, please give me a little drink of water from your jar. And so here we go. He's putting the fleece out there. Drink, Lord, she said. And she quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. And she said, after she had given him a drink, she said, can I draw water for your camels too until they've had enough to drink? So she quickly emptied her jar, went to the trough, and ran back to the well to draw more water, drew enough for all the 10 camels. Now, can you imagine how much water a camel would drink? Uh, verse 62, I'm going to ruin it for you, because in verse 62, she decides to go back to Canaan with the servant, and now Isaac has come out to bear Leha Roy, which means the Lord sees. It's a well that means this is, this is the, the, Lord, the Lord sees you. And, and, and you need to get, some of you don't feel seen. The, the Lord sees you. He sees everything that's happening in your life. He was living in the Negev, and he went out to the field one evening to meditate. 
As he looked up, he saw camels approaching, and Rebekah also looked up and saw Isaac. Their eyes met. She got down from the camel and asked the servant, who is this man in the field coming to meet us? He is my master, the servant answered. She took her veil and covered herself. And then the servant told Isaac all that he had done. And Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebekah, and he became, she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Now, this is very interesting, and I want to draw some truths out of this chapter, and I want you to take them with you because the first one is for the parents. Now, now you say, well, I thought you were talking about singles. Well, you know, at some point, they were single, and they were in your home. So, so parents, I want to start with you. Parents, you need to be praying with fervently for your children. You need to pray for them. 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 Then after you stop praying for them, you need to pray for them. And you need to pray for them. And you start praying right now. God, God, I'm praying for them right now. When Alicia was pregnant with all of our kids, I know this is TMI, but I'm just telling you, I started praying, God, I just pray for them. God, I pray for their salvation. I pray for their spouse. God, I pray for, for their lives. God, I pray that you'd be around them. And I, and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And listen, a covenant prayer for your children is so important. You say, well, my kid's only two years old. I don't care. You pray for them. They're God's gift to you. I had a friend of mine, and he lives in Hattiesburg, and I'm not going to tell you his name uh, because I couldn't get a hold of him to make sure I could share this story. But he, he grew up in another city. He's a really successful guy. And he said he and his sister, he said they knew their parents were praying for him. He said one night he was heading out the door. He told me the story himself. He said we were heading out the door, and I looked back, and I thought, what are the, what is, what's on the carpet? This is just, it's just worn down to nothing. And, and so he went over there, so he called his dad. He said, dad, hey, what, what's wrong? What happened to the carpet? He said, well, son, this is where your mama and I, when y'all leave out on Friday night, this is where we get on our knees and start praying for y'all. He said, they had prayed for them so much they had worn out the carpet. He said, when I would go out on a Friday night, he said, I was thinking, oh my goodness, my parents are praying for me. They're praying for the people I date. They're praying for the people I hang around. They're praying for my mate. And I'm going to tell you, God has blessed this family in an unbelievable fashion. You said, you mean if I pray hard, God lands all of my... No, no, no. I know a lot of people that have prayed and things didn't work out that way. I'm just telling you, prayer is powerful. And also example is powerful. Parents, you know what I do? Now, I'm not, I'm not, this is not a parent sermon, but, but, but singles come from somewhere, and they come from a family. When, when I do weddings, and I don't do that many weddings, Craig and them are great. Craig and all these other pastors are amazing. They, they need to be the ones pastoring you in those ways, and I'll, I'll do a few occasionally. But when I do, I always ask them a question. Uh, tell me about your parents' marriage. What are some things you liked about your parents' marriage? What are some things you didn't like about your parents' marriage? Why? Because that's the trainers for the next generation. You're saying, you're making me feel guilty. You're making me, uh, like I made a mistake. Listen, we all did. I'm just telling you the truth. Like, like they spent 18, 20 years with you. You know, they spend like a, you know, a few hours with us. They're watching you. I'm watching this with my grandkids. I mean, the Lord is like double baptizing me. It's like, like now I went on a field trip with the four-year-olds. Oh, my goodness. Now I know where you go if you're not saved. <laughs> I, it was just unbelievable. But I'm sorry. I take that back. He was great. I was, my son, he was amazing. I was talking about the other kids from another school that came up from North Mississippi. Sorry. <laughs> Whew. But anyway, you know what I was watching with those kids? They weren't listening to a word anybody said. Not one word. But they were watching what we were doing. Had one of the families in front of us, and I, you know, they, they were they remained nameless. And, and you know, and our, my little grandson was sitting there, and her son was sitting there, and she said, Buckle up. He said, Well, you're not buckling up. I went, Mm hmm. I didn't even tell my grandson to buckle up because I wasn't buckling up. You know, I'm just a bad example. But they're watching you. And that's why I tell you about, look, I'm not telling you about church and about house church and about serving for me. This is all about you. 
They're watching you. They do what you do, not what you say. This morning, I get here early when I'm preaching especially, and, and I was here, and there was a family, and, and they work all week. I mean, they're busy. They're tired. You know, they get here, and they both serve on the worship team, and, and they had a three-year-old and a one-year-old sitting over here and just dump some Cheerios in their lap so they could practice, and she's pregnant on top of that. And so I went over and sat down with the kids and kind of played with the kids. I was worn out. Listen, if you work in our children's ministry, I bow to you. I would rather preach 10 times and keep kids for a whole hour. They wore me down to nothing. And I thought, what a great example from these parents that they get their kids up at 6 o'clock in the morning so they can serve God. Listen to me. It means absolutely nothing to profess Christ if your life does not back it up. If you are not living for Jesus, stop telling people that you are a Christ follower because it's confusing to them. And the thing that we've done at Venture, and it's going to thin out the population, we're no longer for concierge Christianity where you drop your kids off on Wednesday night, you go get a latte, and you come back and you hope they're a hate for Jesus. It's not going to happen that way. We have house churches where you come together. And some of our kids, they don't have families like yours. They don't have dads. They don't have moms. And when they come to house church, they get to see a family together. Your kids get to see you open the Bible and read out of the Bible and pray out of the Bible. It's the best way we can possibly take your family and begin to grow you up as a family. Listen, parents, I cannot tell you, if you want good things for your children, don't just pray they'll hit the ball off the tee. Pray they'll be the young men and women God has called them to be. Don't let me rout. See, see the, look, I'm not mad about sports. I love sports. We played every sport. I played sports in college. I'm a sports guy. Man, I, I mean, I, I love everything about it. I love passion. I love to get thrown out of games. I love to tell people I'm Father Tommy. I love all of that. I'm Dean Register. Like, I will jump on the fence and rattle the thing. I'm with you. But we were out the other night, a seven-year-old uh, in, in soccer, and it was lightning was popping, and they were running around, and somebody had to come over and tell them to go back to the cars and wait. Then they ran it back out and lightning popping is my seven-year-old grandson. You know, kicking, come on out here, Bob. I said, I can't, Mark, hurting. I just want some of that for Jesus. I just want a little bit of that for Jesus. I, I mean, I was watching a mom and she was praying, let him hit it off the tee, let him hit it off the tee, let him hit it off the tee. How about praying, God, let him find the right person to spend the rest of his life with because they're going to have my grandchildren. Your children aren't even that good of people. <laughs> They're not. That's why you got to stay alive and help them raise your grandkids. I mean, is anybody listening to a word I'm saying? You know that. You know, watching your kids' parents like watching a drunk mule in a canoe in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> not my kids or yours, but I'm in other churches. Okay, men. Let me share something with men. Men, gentlemen. Pray bold, specific prayers about your relational life as you are going. Now, now he, he, he prays, okay? It's a covenant prayer. Man, you ought to be praying. You just walk in a bar and, you know, it's late. Oh, God, there's somebody still left. Come on, man. Ladies, li listen to me. Ladies, li listen. I'll get the ladies up, but listen. Listen, don't let a guy or a guy, don't let a girl come to you at a bar and say, let me buy you something to drink. Let me buy your drink. Think through that. That'd be like so, you being in Walmart saying, hey, can I buy you a toaster? <laughs> I mean, think about it. It doesn't make any sense. I, I mean, th are you with me? Pray as you go. Go where? Go to work. Go to church. Go to work out, go on a trip. You never know where God's going to take you to find the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with. Listen, my kids, my son married a girl from Tampa. My daughter married a guy from California. She met in Africa. You can't make that up. Tampa and California are, are foreign countries. 
and, and they're married and they've got my grandkids and they're great people. You pray as you go because God is working. He is moving ahead of you. The Bible says, he who finds a good wife finds a good thing, but you gotta find her. That means that you may have to ask her out. All right, I gotta ask a question. Guys, how many of you in all of our campuses how many of you struggle? I mean, like you can text and, you know, you're on the, 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 whatever the site is, you know. How many of you have a hard time just walking up to a young lady and saying, hey, you, would you like to go out sometime? Raise your hand, guys, if you, if you would. Y'all don't need to wrestle each other down over there. What? Anybody? Men? Y'all are liars. <laughs> no, I'm serious. They're not going to marry a liar. A bunch of liars in here. You lying like a dog. Listen, you got to walk up to him. You never, he, I mean, he walked up to her and said, hey, would you give me a drink of water? She said, why don't you get your own water? Your leg broke? I mean, that's, I mean guys are scared of that. I mean, like, hey, would you go out? No, I can't. I'm washing my hair. And uh, I can't go out. You know, I'm getting a tan. But, but gentlemen, you got to ask. you got to pray bold prayers. And you've got to ask. You, you, you've got to, as you go, you are praying. And now, ladies, ladies, listen to me. This is so important. And for the men, too. Keep your standards high and your spiritual growth consistent. You know what scares me? For, for I watch all of our high school and college kids, and I'm watching like the way they go through life. And this is the ideal. I'll party like a rock star, and then when I get mad, we'll have a godly marriage. We're going to have this great wedding, man. It's going to be unbelievable. Yeah, but how about your marriage? We were in New Orleans, and that's a bad start. <laughs> but when it happened, and it wasn't my fault, we were staying in a nice hotel, the nicest hotel we've ever stayed in, and we were sitting in the, in the lobby with another couple. It was a Friday night. It wasn't even a Saturday night. And we're sitting there, and I see this girl in a, in a red dress. She's probably 20, and she kind of comes st stumbling in and falling in and falls down on the couch right across from her, and then her boyfriend comes in, and he's kind of stumbling around. They fall down, and they begin to frolic. <laughs> yeah, oh, my goodness, is right. I said, honey, do you see that? She goes, stop looking at that. Stop looking at that. <laughs> and, and, and I wanted so bad to go over there. I knew they wouldn't remember it. I wanted to go over and say, hey, let me tell you something. I don't know where this is going, but you can't date like hell and marry like heaven. I was out of town. I can bring the heater. But before I could get up, the, the, the security people came down. They handled it much better than I would have, and, and they didn't know where they were. They thought they were in their own house. And I'm thinking, girlfriend, this is, this is going to be a problem because here's the thing. Stay with me. We end up in a good place, but I've got to tell you something. Your past will end up in your future. Hmm. No, I'm a sophomore. I, I'm rolling. Nobody touch me. I got this. No, 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 no. When you're 55, they're going to come into your life and go, hey, how y'all doing? Your past will end up in your future. Because right this second, that's the past. I'm in the future. I'm so shocked when I, when I get into counseling with people and they're like, you know, and they just, just have been crazy-eyed, doing everything imaginable. I mean, living the Viva La Loca. Now it's a local matrimino. And they're like, hey, you know, I want him to be a godly man. I said, like, tonight? You know, like, tonight? You know, like, you know, start right now. 25 years of this, and I'm like, okay, okay, tonight we're going to preach. I'm going to preach Sunday. You're training yourself with regard to relationships. You say, well, what did she do that made her so awesome? Well, number one, she had standards for intimacy. The Bible says when she showed up at the well, she showed up and she had never been with a man. You're going, that's not possible. Jeff, you don't understand the world we live in. I mean, if you're older and you go out on a date, that's just part of it. You know that. But if you wait after two dates, it's all over. Ladies, let me tell you something. If you raise your standards, it will get God's attention. If you start praying and you say, you know what? I'm going to go down this road the way God would have me go down this road. God will all of a sudden be a part of your journey. And he'll be, I'm not telling you he'll give you a man right then, but you can wait a while. You can wait a while. How many of you have been in relationships where you gave yourself to someone way too soon and all of a sudden your heart's broken? 
And now that's all you know. Listen, listen, I, I, you say, well, I don't believe you. Well, I, will you believe Beyonce? All the single ladies? All the single ladies? All the single ladies? If you like it and you love it. I want to do the moves. My wife won't let me. I can break that thing down on you. Work for her 15 years later. So you don't believe the Bible. You believe Beyonce. Garth Brooks got 110,000 people down there. And 10 of them go to church today. Got their lights up. Whoa. What's Garth ever done for you, bro? I didn't, he's not even a good singer. Okay. All right. <clears throat> You say, well, I don't even know, like, I'm sorry, country music people, I'm just playing, it was just a joke. He's amazing, he's wonderful, he's awesome, I have his music downloaded. Okay, <clears throat> but you know, here's the thing. Do you know where Jacob was, not Jacob, Isaac was when all this was happening? Bear Lehe Roy. He's praying. Talk about this next week for Mother's Day. And boy, I'm going to build up the mothers. If you've ever had any anxiety being a mom, you need to bring everybody you know. Because he's at the well of the one who sees. And he's praying. See, his daddy's praying. You, do you see the, how, how this works? His daddy's praying. He's praying. The servant's praying. Rebecca's praying. And all of a sudden, they come together. And they, they had narrowed the window. No Canaanites. The Canaanites are all over them. The Canaanites will always be all over you. And they narrowed the window, and they narrowed the window to the right person. The right person. You, you up your standards, too. You develop your character, men and women. You learn to serve. Look, you college students that are listening to me, I, I cannot understand for the life of me why don't you, you don't serve more at church. Find a place to serve, man. Serve. You've got more time than you'll ever you, I'm busy. I'm busy. Oh, you ain't busy. Listen, you've you got more time than you'll ever have. You can, you can learn things you can never learn anywhere else. Begin to serve. He says, hey, would you give me some words? You go, yeah, and let me water your camels. I know you got 10. That's 100 gallons. I'm going to make 50 trips, and I'm going to come back and forth, and I'm going to be happy about it. You're like, what? It'd be like me driving up looking for like my grandson, uh, uh, when he gets older, uh, uh, a mate, and driving up to Sonic, and driving, a little girl's on skates, and she skates out, and she comes to the window, and I say, hey, would you mind getting me uh, number one? And they're saying, yeah, can I buy it for you, and can I buy something for everybody in the car? See, when you start realizing God, God honors character, God honors when you're selfish, she had a high standard of commitment. I mean, he meets her one day. Think about this. He meets her one day, meets her parents, and says the next morning, hey, I want to take her to a country she has never been to to meet a man she has never met and spend the rest of her life there. That's called leaving and cleaving. It's called, I'm going to be with you till death do us part. See, here are the two questions real quick, and I'm done, okay? Two questions. You ready? Everybody listen. This is very important. You've got to be asking yourself whether you're single, whether you're married, or whether you wish you were single. You've got to ask, am I the right person right now? Am I growing spiritually right now? Am I taking care of my body right now? Am I becoming the person God has called me to be right now? You say, I don't have to do that because I'm going to meet Mr. Wright. You ain't going to meet Mr. Wright or Mr. Wright, Miss Wright, unless you write. And this is your opportunity. You will never hear this anywhere else. Nobody will ever tell you, you need to be right. You need to work on you. You need to think about you. You need to quit worrying about everybody else. Are you right with God? Are you growing spiritually? Are you leading your family are you right right now? Here's the second thing. Uh, are you around the right people? I love what he said. He goes, hey, you know, 
Like, like this is never going to work out with him hanging out with the Canaanites. Because the Canaanites are always going to be going this way. It's like, it's like being yoked together with a racehorse and a mule. I mean, they're just, just going, you know, like a drunken sailor all the time. And that's what a lot of people do in marriage. If you're having to beg a guy to go to church right now, he's not going to be a preacher next week. Listen, guys, you got to watch them. They're sneaky. And if you missionary dating and, oh, I'm going to change him. I'm going, oh, I got him. I'm going, I'm going to make him become a man of God. No, you ain't. Not if God ain't working in him. This is what Paul says, and I'll take it off what I'm saying. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, don't be yoked together with an unbeliever. For what does the righteous and the wicked have in common? Or what does fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and the devil? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Listen to me. If you are dating or you want to date, you, the person you're dating, their physique is not near as important as their faith. You know why? Their physique is going to leave them. I'm living proof. I used to be a stud. I'm telling you, I was mean, lean. I, I watch our little boys play outside. You know, I'm at our staff, shoot basketball. I'm thinking, man, I would, I would have murdered you. Like, I would have destroyed you. But now I got stuff pop, clipping, knocking. <laughs> And you're going to shake, rattle, and roll. After 40, it's going to be spanks and manks. And that's just the way it is. Spanks is for men, manks. And you're going to be pulling stuff and pushing stuff, and there's nothing you can do about it. And if all you look for is, oh, he looking good now. Oh, she looking good now. Oh, she hot. Oh, man, look at that car he's got. All that will pass away. But if they're faithful to God and to you, like I see my in-laws who are watching, 65 years, and I go over there, and neither one of them can walk, you know, without pop. I hear stuff popping as a gunshot, like a drive-by shooting. I'm, pop, I'm just, but I'm just saying, like, when you got up the other day, it scared me. Like, you know, I'm going, let me get that. I'm like, whoa, no, don't get up. Everybody stay home. Citizens arrest. Stay, stay right there. And they're going to, let me help you. Let me serve you. Let, hey, let me do this. I'm saying, please don't. Please, please, God, just stay there. We will get it for you. And I'm watching two people who for 65 years are just the same person. Listen, if you're married and your marriage is terrible right now, I'm going to give you a secret that took me a lifetime to figure out. Couples grow your friendship and the fire will build back in your marriage. Marriage is about friendship. It's about being kind. The reason you fell in love with the person you're married to is that y'all were kind to each other. You wrote notes. You made calls. You went out of your way. You were kind. You backed them up. You defended them. And now when they go, what are you wearing that for? Why? Honk, honk, honk. We're leaving. You better get in here and get those kids. You lost your friendship. You stopped being kind. You stopped dating. Remember all the stuff you did when you were dating, before you got married, when you were hungry? Yeah, that's how I did. Yeah, that's how I did. When you're still hungry, oh, I'm going to dress up. Oh, we're going to, where you want to go? Oh, let's just drive up to Memphis and skate. You know, we did that one night, you know, I mean, back when you could do that. And, and like, like, you know, let's just drive, let's, let's go to, just take, and you're like, oh, yes, my love. Now it's like, what are you talking about? We can't afford that gas. Go over there and sit down. When you said those guys, the dishwasher hadn't been unloaded in two weeks. And I went, I went, I went, I went, I went. I'm sorry, that's another series. But some of y'all like me, you started like a firecracker and you ended like a dud. It's time to get right. Man, it's time for you to get right with your woman. Next week on Mother's Day, you better be here because I'm going to bring something for you. You need to be treating these women right. Ladies, these men need your support. They need your respect. It's time. It's time to get right. I don't care where you've been. You're here now. Bow your heads and close your eyes, and I've got a word that God gave me for you. 
It's not my word. It's out of the Bible. Isaiah 43. You ready for it? This is your verse for a new day, for a pivot in the direction you've been going. God is doing a new thing. Now it is springing up. (laughs) Do you not see it? God is making a way in the wilderness and streams in the desert to give you the life God's always dreamed you would have because he sees you and he loves you. He knows what it feels like when you're all alone. He knows what it feels like when you're not getting dates. He knows what it feels like when you've had the wrong dates. He knows what it feels like to be single again. He knows, he sees, he loves Come to him. Come close to him. And you'll recognize his presence. Father, I love these people so much. I see the carnage that happens in their lives, in their kids' lives, and it is it is unbearable. It's unbearable. God, move on us. I can't preach a sermon and make a difference. We need your spirit to move. We need your power to move. We need a revival in our hearts and our families. God, convict us of sin. God, God, clean it out and draw us to you so we can be men of God to love our wives and lead our families. God, we need you and we love you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.